Hi, and thank you for visiting with me. My name's Todd Brown, the lead pastor at Bridge Christian Church. I want to talk with you about what it means to be a Christian and how to become a follower of Jesus. Just before Jesus returned to heaven, he gathered his followers together and gave them this commission. It's found at the very end of the book of Matthew, the first book in the New Testament. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, in teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Jesus sent his disciples into the world to make other disciples of Christ. For centuries, Jesus' followers have been leading others to become Jesus' followers as well. It's much more than getting saved or becoming a churchgoer. It's about being all in with your faith, your lifestyle, your hope for heaven, and your desire to see others become Jesus' followers as well. Being a Christian means that you've decided to let Jesus be the Lord of your life. It means following his example and living by his commands. It means loving people sacrificially just as Jesus did. Being a Christian means being a part of a great movement, a worldwide family called the church. The church is a place where you can grow in your faith and in turn help others grow. The promises God gives to you when you give your life to Christ are these. The complete forgiveness of your sins. The presence of his own spirit living inside of you to coach and encourage you along the way. And the promise that even though you die physically, you will live forever with other believers in heaven. Being baptized is only part of the transformation that takes place when you become a follower of Jesus Christ. I want to share with you, using the words from the New Testament, the few but important steps to take in becoming a Christian. First, you must believe. That's simply what faith in Jesus means, to believe that he really was God's Son, sent to earth to show us God's path to heaven. Here's the promise Jesus made to all who would believe. It's found in the Gospel of John, chapter 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God didn't send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Believing in Jesus is more than just acknowledging that he was an actual historical figure who walked the earth a couple of thousand years ago. It means believing that he came to save us by dying on a cross to pay off our sin debt. It means believing that he rose from the grave three days after his crucifixion. It means believing that he lives in heaven and will one day come to bring us to be with him. It means believing that he wants to live in your heart and mind as your friend, your counselor, and your king. Do you believe in Jesus? Secondly, you must repent of your sin. Jesus once said this about the purpose of his coming to earth. It's found in Luke chapter 5. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners, to repentance. Jesus came to ask sin-sick people to repent of their sinful ways. Repenting simply means to feel or express sincere regret or remorse about your wrongdoing. Simply put, you can't bring your old sinful actions and attitudes with you if you're going to be a follower of Jesus. And right here is where you have to count the cost. It's going to cost you to repent. Old, cherish, and comfortable sinful practices have to go. Sexual purity needs to be a a priority in your life. Wicked thoughts and words and habits, they all have to be put away. Maybe some unhealthy relationships will have to be put on hold. You see, sin really is a sickness. 
It eats away at our soul, introduces us to physically unhealthy habits. The Bible says it blinds us to the truth of God's love. The book of Acts is the fifth book in your New Testament, and it records the stories of Jesus' disciples teaching others about Christ. In Acts chapter 2, the apostle Peter's preaching to the very crowd that demanded Jesus to be crucified. When they realized with sadness and alarm what they had done, they desperately cried out, what can we do? Peter responds in Acts 2, 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all who will call on the name of the Lord. It's time for you, if you're really serious about becoming a Jesus follower, to take inventory of the sin in your life and repent. I think you know right now that that's the thing you need to do. Your sin has brought you nothing but trouble and regret. Why don't you let go of it? It doesn't mean that those old habits will end immediately. It might take some time to shed some of those old familiar ways. But repentance means you want to. You're willing to make a change that will one day bring you good. Will you repent? The third step in becoming a follower of Jesus is to verbally profess him as the new Lord of your life. Listen to the Apostle Paul's instruction to the would-be followers of Jesus in Rome from Romans chapter 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Paul reminded his young friend Timothy to be true to his confession of Jesus from 1 Timothy chapter 6. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, and endurance and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Making a profession of your faith in Jesus means that you are voicing your allegiance to him. You're making a promise to God and to any who hear it that Jesus will be your Lord. You have to say it. Jesus wants you to speak it as part of the initiation of becoming his follower. Why is it important? Because he wants you to keep on speaking it, to keep on letting people know that you're not ashamed that you belong to him. Professing, confessing your love and allegiance to Jesus is much like making wedding vows. If you love him, say it. Would you say this? right now out loud? I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Today I want to let him become both my Savior and the Lord of my life. The next step is to be baptized. Baptism is our physical participation in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Being purposely and obediently buried in a grave of water unites us supernaturally with Jesus. The scripture calls it being united with him. It's the very same word that Paul uses about husbands and wives being physically joined. Just as married partners are joined, baptism unites us with Christ. Listen to Paul writing about this in Romans chapter 6. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we, we believe that we will also live with him. Now, burying someone in water doesn't make them a Christian. It only becomes a vital part of the transformation if there's been a repentance and a confession. There must be a desire in you to want to be united with Christ, to secure the promises God has made. 
Baptism is about dying to your old self and becoming who Jesus desires you to be. And there it is again. It's going to cost you. It's saying goodbye to your old you. It means you're finished with your old sin. Baptism is both your burial and your rebirth. In dying, you'll live forever. Baptism is another aspect to it. It marks you as a believer. Here's what I mean. For centuries, God demanded that every Jewish male be circumcised. It was a cutting in a man's flesh that marked him as belonging to God. Paul seems to indicate that the physical cutting of the flesh has been replaced by a circumcision of the heart performed at baptism. He writes about it in Colossians 2. In him, that is Jesus, you were also circumcised with the circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Again, Jesus told his disciples to make other disciples by baptizing them. Will you submit to that transformation that comes by your faith through a water grave. Finally, will you remain in him? The last lesson Jesus taught his disciples on the night of his arrest and just before his crucifixion was this. It's found in John chapter 15. Jesus said, I am the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burn. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. We're commanded to bear fruit. That doesn't mean sprouting grapes or producing apples from our arms and legs. It means to make changes in people's lives like Jesus has done in yours. Being fruitful means that you have something to show for all God's done for you. And to bear that kind of good fruit means you must remain attached to the vine, and that vine is Jesus. There will always be the temptation to let go of your faith and turn your back on this new way of living. Old sins will come calling to seduce you away from your allegiance to Jesus. It will always be a struggle to remain true, connected, and fruitful. That's why the church will be such a good place for you. We're all in this together. We can become more fruitful together. I encourage you that if you've decided to become a Christian, a follower of Jesus, that you decide right now that you will remain faithful, determined. So these steps that I've taken you through are only the first steps. These are steps meant to be repeated the rest of your life, to believe today and be a believer every day, to repent now and live a life of turning away from sin, to profess your allegiance now and every day to never be ashamed that Jesus is the Lord of your life, to be faithful, united with Jesus, one with him, remembering the promise you made to him and holding on to his promise to you of eternal life, and to remain in him so that you fulfill his desire for you to be fruitful, creating through your faith a great harvest of other followers of Jesus. If you'd like more information about the practice of baptism, I encourage you to go to our website and look at the tab about us, then what we believe. Then you can pull up what we teach about baptism. If you'd like for us to baptize you, we'd be thrilled and greatly honored. You can contact the church at this number on your screen and someone will get back to you as soon as we can. If you just need to talk to, to someone uh, about what it means to completely give your life to Christ. Call the church. Someone from our staff will call you back. We're more than anxious to talk to you. I'm so glad you visited me. God is doing something in your life, isn't he? Why not let him? And let me know what I can do for you. Thank you.